At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 445, interview with Louise Andress Moore about her book, Alfred, The Quiet History of a World War II Infantryman. The author did not know that her father had served as a frontline machine gunner until he was in his 80s. Not wanting to upset his young wife back then, who cared for their newborn daughter, Alfred told her that he had been a barber, a chauffeur, and translator. But there was much more to the story, and it took Louise, his daughter, 17 years and much research to unearth it. And what a story it is. Louise, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm very happy to be able to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. No, so I read your book. I listened to the audio book. We'll go into all that later. But a very powerful, very moving uh, story. So let's jump into this. Now, normally, my first question would be, so how did you hear about the story? But that doesn't really work for you. Because what people are going to find out when they open the first page is that there's actually two stories in this book. There's obviously your father's story and what he went through, but there's also your story and what you had to figure out that he went through uh, during the war, because it's not like he came home and told you every little thing uh, that he went through. So um, so could you tell us a little bit um, about what your father kind of, you know, in a very lim- limited way said when he got home or when y'all got older and, and uh, he what he talked about the war, but at the same time, when did you realize there was a little bit more than what he was giving away? Well, I was actually born sixth in the family. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of time before me um, that he didn't talk either, to be honest. So I'm toward the end of the family. And for what I would say was about the first 57 years after the war, Mm -hmm. he only knew that he spoke of his duties as a barber, a chauffeur, and a translator. And that's basically it. Right. And there were little stories attached to those duties, but we didn't know much. Mm -hmm. And um, I always say what had to happen is the perfect storm for my father's story to come out. Right. And that wouldn't happen in too many families or situations. But the first part of that storm is that my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. And that was my dad's support for all those years. They'd been married even before he went to war and he was there for, and and she was a very strong supportive person. She actually, I asked my dad once, did, did mom understand what you had gone through the war? And he said, yeah. And I said, did you tell her? No. (laughs) And we're quite certain she had no idea, Right. but there was actually a letter that came from the government saying, don't ask questions. My aunt told me that after my mom had died and actually at the French Legion of Honor ceremony day. But my aunt said, yes, I think the parents and the wives primarily got um, a letter saying, don't ask questions. That makes sense. And she would have respected that. She would do whatever she was told by government doctors, you know, whatever. Sure. Authority. Anyway, um, she knew something had changed. She knew he came back a different man. And she said war was hard on dad. But when she told me those things, I might have been in my 20s or 30s, and I did not ask questions. I didn't, not that I couldn't ask questions. I didn't think of saying, what do you mean? Explain that more. How did he change? I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, okay, so he was a barber, chauffeur, and translator. So my mom passed away, and there was a family friend who couldn't make it to the funeral. But a couple weeks after the uh, funeral, He came to our farm. He had been in the army. And just for something kind of to do, we went through my dad's army trunk. And he saw within the army trunk probably a discharge paper with his military occupation. Um, And he said, okay, he was a machine gunner. So that's basically how it happened. That's one part of it. 
Then within, let's say, four to five months, my dad broke his hip. Mm. And he went to a, a nursing home for rehab, but he never learned to walk again. And he decided to stay at that nursing home. Right. And, um, okay, so if my mom had lived, there would have he would have been probably at the farm and there would have been so much distraction. There would have been grandkids. My dad right. was still kind of farming, you know, he was mm -hmm. 83, but you know, he'd do tractors and crops and putts around. Good for um, him. So my dad is suddenly without his wife. He's in a nursing home without being able to be active. And I said to my siblings early on, I said, okay, I'll do Saturdays. Right. What that gave me was kind of a, a, a chunk of time where it was possible to ask questions about the war. There were no long stories, nothing like that. Right. But I had to drive two hours, to almost two hours to get to him and two hours home. So being a math person, <laughs> math teacher, <laughs> I, I figured my little formula is you stay on site as long as you've had to travel. Okay. And so I stayed with him like three and a half hours. That war wasn't the main topic at all. You know, we'd go visit people. We'd go for a ride. We'd go out to eat, whatever, wheelchair walks, whatever. Yeah. Sometimes he'd nap, I'd read, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I, that's kind of the image. Um, as I said, no long stories. Right. And sometimes I tried to have one idea a week, but they sometimes didn't move very far. Right. I could give you an example. Please. One week, I read that there was a soldier or a veteran who uh, couldn't eat fruit cocktail after the war. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, there's a good story. I mean, he had had so much of it, he couldn't stand it. He couldn't <laughs> possibly. So right. I go to the nursing home and I say, Dad, how do you feel about fruit cocktail? And he said, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah. And he never elaborated too much, but right. he was eating K-rations. Right. You know, there wasn't any fruit cocktail in there. Gotcha. There wasn't room for that. Right. Um, I have some K-rations that were in his army trunk, and we never did go in that army trunk. One of my cousins said, oh, we would have been playing with that stuff. <laughs> you know, we never, we never did that. So I have, I have K-rations, you That's know, where it's yeah. crackers and a candy bar and toilet paper, and you could see where the cigarettes fit in. And um, the other half of it was kind of a tuna size can of protein. Right. Okay. But um, anyway, he, he never had, he didn't get fruit cocktail. So right. there were days when there wasn't, or weekends, Saturdays when not much went on. Sure. I, I, just a, a follow-up question real quick. So it sounds like your father comes home, and, and, and he doesn't certainly sound like a, gre a gregarious man in the first place before the war, but it sounds like he came home, he set the tone, this is, you know, this is something I did. I don't really want to go into detail. And, and I love that description in the book because most often your questions are longer than his responses. I mean, this guy <laughs> is just pretty much buttoned down. It's something he did, but it's not it's not, you know, he, he doesn't dwell on it. I, would that be fair? I think he, I would say he was concise. There we go. There we he go. Was he was concise. And if he were talking about something funny mm -hmm. or a story that way, it would go on longer. But as far as the war, right. yeah, no, that pretty makes limited. Sense. Now, if I could, let me just jump a second um, to uh, a question about your story. So if, if I if I've got this right, and please correct me if I don't, it sounds like when you first started finding out there was more to it than just the barber, chef, or translator, I get the sense maybe it's the type of person you are. You wanted to organize things. You wanted to write these things down and have a, a clearer picture. But at some point, it sounds like that becomes... I, I need to get all of this down. I need to turn it into a book. Where along in the narrative do you go, I need to do more than just a couple of pages of what my father went through? At the very beginning, I thought I would have like 10 to 20 pages. Right. And I would make it into a attachment for email. And I'd send it to, you know, my sibs, my nieces and nephews, my kids, mm -hmm. my dad's nieces and nephews, you know, whatever. I just thought I would, it yeah. would be 10 to 20 pages. 
And I thought I was going to take some of his little stories that he had said, and I'd put them into context um, about the time that that family friend came and told us about the um, him being a machine gunner. Right. There was a book, a, um, a regimental history book. Mm. And they're like, they're probably all the same size, four by five inches. They're only about 50 pages and uh, some pictures in them. Right. And I thought, oh, I can just take that little book and I'll just insert his little stories as to where they occurred. But that doesn't, that doesn't work. And part <laughs> of the reason is um, a regimental little book is written with pride, yeah. kind of. Mm-hmm. And it's also all mixed up with the 134th and the 137th regiments. Right. And I didn't understand that when I first started reading it. I didn't understand the organization of a, of a division. So I would look at that book and I'd say, just tell me what my dad did. <laughs> Get rid of those other people, you know. Absolutely. Um, but that was that was my job. Right. So um, when I started, I just thought I'd put his few stories into context. And um, then it did evolve that where I had five campaigns. And I had to kind of figure out maybe what occurred in those campaigns for my father, even without his comments. Right. What kind of happened is I thought, okay, after five years, I nominated him for the French Legion of Honor. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a good day. It wasn't a great day. Right. And the reason was, okay, so he had his own ceremony, which is nice, but I told the French consulate that we couldn't get him to Chicago. Um, that that was too hard on him. Sure. He had about a three-hour window of time, and then he'd get pooped out. Um, so they came to the nursing home, and his ceremony was just for him. We had 100 people there. There were two little, yeah, not little, but two TV cameras from Madison, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and a little Lodi Enterprise. Anyway, on that day, I, I gave the summary of what he had done in war. Right. And... The woman from the French consulate came up to me afterward and said, does he understand? And I said, oh, yeah, cognitively, he's fine. He just yeah. can't walk. Right. Like she was looking at the place and thinking, OK, maybe he's got some cognitive problems. And I was like, not a problem. But um, when I watched the video, I understood why she asked the question, because he was so flat affect. Right. And um, not much satisfaction. I've seen pictures in the paper of people receiving French Legion of Honors and that veterans just beaming Mm -hmm. my dad would for the photos i suppose he would have done that but not at the time when it was happening and i thought okay it wasn't perfect he had a good day we had a good day it was fun you know we had a cater and we had a little calvados served in um medicine cups Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) um and you know shared a little bit and i went home after that and i thought okay it wasn't perfect but I've given it my best. I have tried to make him feel good about what he did in the war, that it was appreciated, um, that it was significant. And I went home and I remember kind of sitting at the computer and going, let's wrap this up. Right. And I wanted to finish, you know, five years is even enough time. Right. I was maybe losing my motivation a little bit, but what happened is that things kept evolving <laughs> after the French Legion of Honor. And I think about half the book came after that. Wow. You know, yeah. And um, what happened is that a couple months after the French Legion of Honor, I asked my dad about somebody who had died in war because that person's nephew, that that deceased veteran's nephew, wanted me to do that. Mm-hmm. He wanted a story about his uncle. And um, when I asked, it was as if a floodgate had opened. For about five or six minutes, it was as if my dad had to tell me something. Wow. And part of that, and I grabbed grabbed a Christmas letter and wrote on the back side of it as I stood by his recliner and he's talking. And one of the things he said was dead bodies floating in the water. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what that meant because I knew the 35th Division had not been involved in D-Day. Right. And... Actually, I had said that. That's that's basically where the problem came. Mm-hmm. I said that in front of two TV cameras and 100 people. And he was offended. And he he was like, they don't they're giving me this big award and they don't even know what I did. Right. 
And at one point, yeah, but he blamed the French, not me. Anyway, <laughs> thank he you, Dad. He can't blame you. You're his daughter. No, yeah, I'm his daughter. I was coming to visit him. He, he loved me, whatever. Blame the whole country of France. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but um, suddenly I had to understand that phrase, dead bodies floating in water, and there was more unfolding. I thought it might have been a river crossing because the 35th had done t- 10 of those. Wow. But there was a point where I had amassed so much information that I'd spent so much time. In the end, it was like 17, almost 18 years of of research and writing. Right. I mean, I wasn't doing it full time, but um, as much as I could. And I knew it would be a major regret at the end of my life if I didn't write it down. If I were on my deathbed and I hadn't written this all down, I knew I'd be lost. And that was too much for me. Um, to, to lose. And I also, it was starting to become too much for for me to remember. Ah, right. And there was one other thing that happened very early on in my research. Somebody asked what I was doing, and I said, I'm researching World War II, what my father did, and he's pained by it all. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, I have a theory about that. Some can take it, and some can't. Ooh. Uh-huh, ooh. Yeah. Um. And I felt I owed it to my father to understand what he had done. Good for you. I just knew, I just knew it had been, if he was pained, I knew there was something significant. Right. So that's part of what kept me going. And part of maybe from finishing the book completely is it was getting to be so much. My, my, I wasn't being able to hang on to all the bits and pieces of it. All right. the people I'd met, all the things they had said, all of that. Right. If I could, I'm glad you mentioned the 17 years that you worked on this. Obviously, you had a family, you had a job, you were doing other things. But for other people out there who are thinking about doing a big project, or maybe a relative of theirs was in the war, I mean, you know, if you keep working at it, it eventually, you know, you'll have, you know, the fruit of your labor. And I'm certainly glad you did, because this story tugged at every heartstring I, I, ones I didn't even know I had. And, and we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to get into that. But so, so you're going along, you're doing this. And, and you mentioned this a second ago, you found out that your father was more than a barber, more than a chauffeur, more than a translator. He was working with uh, what machine guns. I mean, that, that did he, did he just not want to go into that because he didn't want to think about it, but he had some very intense responsibilities and he was right there on the front lines with the other men. Yes. So he, I think he told us about being a barber, chauffeur, and translator. Those are pleasant. They're not painful. Right. And the machine gun part was painful. Right. And it has, it probably has to do with, eh, for him, maybe thou shalt not kill. He was a pretty mild guy. Right. Another little part that I think is in the book a little bit, he was German. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's not that he, he liked any of it, but he knew kind of the, the German draft veteran who right. was was somebody he could relate to. They were both doing things they didn't really want to do. Yeah. And he knew probably if the war wasn't going on, he'd be that guy's friend. And I think that kind of posed a problem for him. He also said to my brother, and it was actually at a wedding, mm-hmm. um, which sounds strange, and I'd give the background, but that's in the book. And he said to my brother, as my brother was wheeling him away from a conversation with the groom's other grandfather, who also had been in the war. Right. Um, my dad said to my brother, I got a lot of them, but I didn't like it. Right. So that's kind of how he felt about it. And then another time to that same brother. Okay, so I had um, six siblings at that time that were feeding me information. So whenever my dad said something to them, they fed it to me. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really helpful, though, yes. because some of these things were said exactly once. Yeah. Um, so they would feed it to me and tell me, email me or tell me on the phone. And there was another time. He Well, he got the a bronze star. Let me think. How was that? He got the bronze star for his combat infantry badge. Mm-hmm. Um, and that wasn't really for anything that he had a specific action. It was just because that became part after the war that anyone who had a combat infantry badge deserved a brand start. So I ordered that for him because I thought that would be helpful to yeah. show that's kind of a, a 
pride thing, maybe. Right. And it got delivered to the farm. My that brother took it down to the nursing home. He didn't look at it or touch it. Wow. He asked my sister to take it home. And when another, you know, there's a bunch of us. Then when another sister called, he said to her, I don't know why you should get medals for killing. Right. So um that's in, that's powerful. Um, that you know, that's yeah. part of it. And then at a, okay, then the next day after that. Bronze Star came. He was talking to a former classmate of his. The classmate left. Mm -hmm. He had told that woman something. And my brother said, well, my father had, in the Battle of the Bulge had had to machine gun into snowbanks. Right. And my brother asked him, were all the people in the snowbanks Germans? And my dad said, no. Right. I had to shoot them all. And they were holding Americans hostage or, you know, prisoners. Yes. So he knew he wasn't just killing the enemy. He knew he, knew he was killing his own people, too. Right. And, and so those are all just part little tidbits. They were said exactly once, but that's why he couldn't go there, I think. He never had come to terms with it. Right. It was something he had to do. He just wanted to survive and get back home to his wife. And then as we're going to get into later, he's going to find out he's got a daughter. So before we go on, because I'm going to ask you to, to describe, you know, whatever level uh, you feel comfortable with about some of his campaigns. Um, I want to stress to everybody who's listening that when I got the audio book, you know, I enjoyed the book. I read the book. It had powerful moments. But when I got the audio book, you're the one reading the audio book. So there's that personal connection. But the other thing is you were able to... Um, uh, copy uh, the way he spoke. He had he had his own <laughs> way, to and that is what really brought it to me. I felt like I was hearing him tell stories, and that just took it to a whole nother level. And I can't thank you enough for that incredible journey that I got to go on by listening to you read this story. So for anybody who's out there, yes, the book is amazing, but I certainly encourage you to get the audio book if you want to get that sense of how this man, how he spoke and how he carried himself, because you you do a very good job. Maybe acting is in your future. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> to whatever degree, and, and you certainly feel free to respond to any of that. But then I'm going to ask you if you could kind of touch on the campaigns that he went through, because this is the meat of the story. And this is the, also the meat of what a lot of that he left out because of the pain and because of all the things that he had to do that he did not pr want to do. Okay. Uh, speaking of, about his speech, yeah. he was German and he couldn't say THs. Right. So I, when I was writing, whenever I was quoting him, I took away his THs and it's dis, dad, dees, and does, and, <laughs> tick, and a tunder. Right. And, uh, and one person that read the book early on, he said it was confusing to him, but I was like, nope, I got to do it. And other yeah. people have said, I knew the man. I can hear his voice. I, yes. The whole thing, it fits for them. Yes. And I wanted it. Uh, yeah, I, I needed that for myself. So, okay, well, that gives me permission to speak like him then. <laughs> Absolutely. Please, I'm begging you. Yes. <laughs> you know, another thing, after that person came and mentioned about being a, a gunner, mm -hmm. that my dad was a gunner, I was getting ready to go to a class reunion. And my dad said that night, and this was within weeks of when my mother had passed away. Right. He was looking at that little regimental book, and he said, some guys wrote down where, they, where we had been, but I never did because I never thought I would live through it. Wow. And, and that was another thing of like, okay, so what exactly happened? That was really early. That yes. was before he had broken his hip. Right. But um, So if I just summarize real quickly. Yeah. He was primarily in the 35th Division, mm -hmm. and he had a water-cooled, I'm not into weaponry, sure. but I know I know his weapon. Yeah. It was uh, a water-cooled 30 caliber machine gun, and I think it was left over from World War I. Um, and the water was in a sleeve around the barrel, and the reason for that is to, probably everyone knows, but to prevent it from overheating. Mm -hmm. You can shoot longer and it doesn't overheat. Right. And he served primarily with the 35th Division. Um and there were five campaigns, like went all across in, uh, all across France. Right. Battle of the Bulge in Belgium, a little bit in Luxembourg. They liberated Venlo in the Netherlands, and then went to into Germany to meet the Russians at the Elbe. So they did pretty, you know, a yeah. lot of it. And he was in all five. That's what st yes. stood out for me, and because this guy's waking up every day going. 
this could be my last day. And he does oh. that through five campaigns, the mental anguish alone. Sorry, I, I just had to no, get that no, up. No, and that actually they kind of put some sort of limit on it where you are permanently psychologically damaged. And I don't know what the number was. And I don't know if my dad almost reached it or I can't remember right now. Right. But they say there are there are not many that go that long through all those campaigns without getting hurt mm-hmm. or killed. Right. But Robert Phillips was a buddy of mine in Georgia. I called him my 94-year-old boyfriend, <laughs> but I could call him any anytime I wanted. And I asked him how many made it through all five. He did also. Right. Um, and he said there were a few, but not many. Right. He said there were there were some. <sighs> so so if you want me to talk a little bit about the Please. campaigns. Please, yes, ma'am. I have a chapter on each campaign. Mm-hmm. And the, the Battle of the Bulge is the longest. Right. Um, partly because there's so much written about it. Right. And then I do, after the first, the five campaigns, and I split Rhineland into two because part was before the Battle of the Bulge and part was after. Mm-hmm. And then later in the book, I do a chapter on D-Day and D-Day plus one because of things that I found out. Right. So in Normandy, if I'm giving a talk at a library with a, PowerPoint and a map. Mm-hmm. What I tend to say about Normandy for the 35th Division is I mentioned St. Lo or San Lo. And um, whenever I read about San Lo, St. Lo, mm-hmm. uh, they mentioned the smell. And it was it was hot, it was summer, and they just mentioned how how strong the smell was of animals and men lying dead together. Right. And that that's the main thing that I just say about that. I also mentioned like living in foxholes, K rations, the role of the machine gunner. Mm -hmm. Um, I introduced everyone to Robert Phillips and talk about the hedgerows, which we weren't prepared for. Right. Um, But anyway, that's about what I say for Normandy. Okay. For Northern France, um, there was the largest carpet bombing raid in the history of the world. And my dad um, had mentioned that to that family friend. And he said, at a different time, not when we were there. And my dad had said, somebody's going to catch hell. Somebody's going to get it today or something like that when the plane started going over. Right. So they weren't as impacted. The 35th wasn't as impacted as some, but they saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, and General McNair died in that bombing. And my dad said, they made such a big deal about that officer being killed. And I think what he was saying is, I've lost so many friends already. Right. Nobody cares. And here's one person. And uh, it's yeah. such a big deal. But I mean, he wasn't really impressed with officers. Okay. I have to say that. <laughs> he, was, right. he was just okay with them. He didn't think they were any big deal. Kind of. Exactly. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I remember the, um, the, the sense uh, of stench. And uh, when he first comes over, I mean... He, he, I can't remember how exactly you put it in the book, but even though he's got the machine gun, sometimes I think he might have been behind the, the rifleman. Sometimes he was mixed in with them. So this, yes. he was facing danger pretty much all the time that they were in combat. He wasn't safely back, you know, firing from yeah. a safe distance. No. Robert Phillips talked to me about that more than my dad. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And Robert Phillips said, I think it would have been better for us always to be behind because – if we got in trouble, there was no one to get us out then. Because if everyone was like flat in the field or something, there was no one to try to break that because they were also in a problem situation. He thought they all they should have been behind all the time. But anyway, my dad mentioned how he would shoot over the heads of the riflemen right. to allow them to advance. And then mm-hmm. I think he said in the morning, we'd, we'd know how it had gone. Because right. it, it seemed like maybe they did that at night. They shot over the heads so the, the, of the riflemen so the riflemen could advance. Mm-hmm. But in the morning, you'd see how many bodies were on the field. And wow. you'd know what had happened. Right. That's it, how he explained it. Yeah, he gets to see the results of his own work. And again, he's not enjoying this, but he certainly doesn't want to die. He doesn't want his friends, his colleagues to die. Right. Wow. Right. And okay. you're witnessing it in the morning. Yes. Um, it was during Northern France that the 35th became part of Patton's army. Mm-hmm. And he actually flagged 
the 35th off the road and said, well, go to Mortain. There could be something that happens there. I don't really think so, but that, that's what he did. Right. So what happened, well, okay, I'll say one thing too. It, it has made me sad sometimes that I spent 17 years on one project. But if I hadn't spent 17 years, I might have missed somebody that I found from Martin mm -hmm. that, that completed the story. So what happened, and I found that man 71 years in one day after he was rescued, which means mm -hmm. that was about 14 years into writing the book. Wow. And if I had finished the book at 10 years, right. Bob Esther wouldn't be in my book, and I, I'm happy to have him. Absolutely. But what happened is Dad's 1st Battalion was told, going back, Mm -hmm. There's a hill or mountain outside of Mortain, and a regiment from the 30th Division was trapped at the top, surrounded by or cut off by Germans all around. Mm -hmm. They were low on batteries. They were low on food. They, you know, right. they were supposed to be up there to tell others what's happening, and they didn't have any way to give that information. There were people dying. Wow. And my dad's battalion was told to cut through the Germans and go rescue the ones at the top. So um, it was a harrowing thing. Robert Phillips told me more about it. And they were successful. Mm -hmm. And Bob Esser was on the top. And my dad is the one who, who cut through. And they both received presidential unit citations for right. that. And what's very interesting, well, two things. Number one, Bob Esser and my dad, there's a little village called Dane. It's very small. Mm -hmm you know, 2,000 people, something like that. Um, both of those soldiers, my dad and the man that was at the top of the mountain, started the Dane Legion after the war. They were both, but I don't think they knew each other because wow. Bob Esther then moved to Madison. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty rare to, I mean, that wasn't a huge, a huge action. Right. Um, a battalion has 900. I think Rob uh, Bob Esser said he had 700 that went up to the top. Mm -hmm. But uh, that those two people would be in the same little village in the state of Wisconsin after the war. Right. And I bet neither one said the word Mortain. In fact, after the book, I mean, the book was entirely written. And I thought, you know, Dad never said a thing other than the word Mortain. Right. And you had That's to do it. the rest <laughs> with, you know, yeah. with all the yeah. respect. Yeah. No, there's, what's that saying? Um, good luck is the residue of hard work. And I got the sense as I'm going through your book, because again, this is a, this is your journey discovering about your father. And it was all, and we'll get into all that, some of the details later, but you did a lot of footwork. There was a lot of investigating. There was a lot of research and you obviously had help from other people as well, but yeah. no, th this, this was your journey. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is this was your journey to find out what your father didn't say about himself during the war. And that comes across in the book. And, and if I may, that is very powerful, almost as powerful as your father's story. And I and that really I'm glad you spent I'm sorry you spent 17 years, but I'm glad you <laughs> did because the results speak for themselves. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I just finished. Northern France. Right. And then the next campaign was Rhineland part one. Mm -hmm. That's when my dad learned he had become a father. Oh, yes. And I asked him, I said, what were you doing when you got the news? And he, he was never, a, he was never fast about speaking and he was fast. And he said, I don't know. Oh. And my oldest brother who has a child said, he knows what he was doing. <laughs> you know, you know, you remember <laughs> your first child, all of them, yes. you know what you're doing. Yes. But I have a feeling that um, he had been involved in uh, in one of the other regiments and they maybe had been surrounded on three sides the day before or that mm. day. And I think he couldn't even be happy because I, I, I suspect he might have been angry that he'd never see that child. But I don't know that. Right. And he yeah. didn't want to say, but I don't think there was great happiness. I think he just felt, I'm never going to see her. Yeah. I'm not going to see my wife. And now here's another one I'm never right. going to see. So, wow. Right. Wow. Sorry. Um, at that time in Rhineland, they also got to take their first shower in three months at she, Nancy. Yes. So that was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> he has good memories of Nan of that city. Good. 
Nazi, I suppose. Exactly. And then it started to rain. Mm-hmm. And there was so much mud in the Gramercy Forest. Uh, and one of the cool things, though, that happened is one day somebody sent through National Archive videos into the 35th Division um, group. Right. And I, there were about 15 or 20, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to look at one of them. Mm-hmm. I saw the word mud and I went to mud <laughs> because I knew about the Gramercy Forest. And a minute and 10 seconds into mud, mm-hmm. I'm watching and there's two guys that drop into a foxhole. It's more amusing than that, actually, because they have it set up at the top of a car over. Oh, but wow. again, I didn't find that until my dad had passed away. But right. that would have been a great story. But anyway, two soldiers dropped in. And as I was watching those two soldiers, I go, huh. I think the one on the left is my dad. Right. I go back and forth, back and forth, send it to you know everybody that might have known him. Mm-hmm. We thought it was possible. Then I had somebody grab a photo off the video, you know, uh, mm-hmm. stop it, grab a photo. And I sent that to my buddy again, Robert Phillips in Georgia. Mm-hmm. I said, who do you think's on the right-hand side? And he goes, Louis Gogol. Right. <laughs> I thought, if he knows who's on the right-hand side, I think that's my dad on the left. And about three years later, he sent me a photo from his photo, uh, well, from a scrapbook. Mm-hmm. And you know how they used to have those little black corners to hold a page yes. on a scrap, old scrapbook? Yes. Well, he had taken that off, and then he could see my dad's name. Oh. He said he had Andres, when actually it's Endres. He had it with an A, right. and it said German interpreter with Gogol. So that was and him. Those are the same two men. Yeah. And that, that was from after the war, from occupation. And could I just real quick, and and we don't have to go into this, but you put me in the foxhole, and I know this is going to come later, but I um I'm now I think I had nightmares uh, that night after I read that section. I mean, it's it's cold, it's 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 minimalist, it's it's full of water, or, or just what these men went through, uh, and day in and day out, it was just just amazing, just overwhelming. I I actually don't know if I put this in the book. It might be. But my dad told me once about a rat. Right. It was a rat in his foxhole. (laughs) Like he was in the foxhole and there was a rat. Right. And he said he jumped out so fast and and he laughed at himself. He said, why did I do that? I had a gun. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, rat. (laughs) Yes, yes. There are enemy soldiers around. You might want to get back in. Not box home. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it's human nature, right? It's human nature. Right, right. He was just shocked by it. And with that National Archive video, I think, okay, I found my dad. I'm quite certain. Can't prove it. Right. Uh, that's one chance out of 16 million. That's pretty good. That's pretty <laughs> That That's is pretty good. very good. You, 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 all that research is paying off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, so after that, they were sitting in foxholes all wet. Mm -hmm. And then they were ordered up to Metz, France, to go to the Battle of the Bulge. Right. And um, they could take another shower in in two months. It had been two months. And Patton had said they should be able to have their Christmas dinner in Metz because the 35th had been on the line for 162 consecutive days. And he's like, okay, they deserve a break. Yes. Um, Even though they were kind of needed at the Battle of the Bulge. But anyway, the bathhouse, they... There's a bathhouse in Metz. That's where all the soldiers took showers. And the manager admitted to my dad and another friend, Ben Lane, Mm -hmm. that he had nothing to give to his children for Christmas. And um, then dad and Ben Lane gave their fruit and chocolate from their army rations. And they quickly went to the house on Christmas Eve. And they had to leave quickly because they were supposed to be Santa, I suppose. And um, the manager cried. Ben told me that. Mm -hmm. Ben uh, that the manager cried and said, we'll see you when you come back from fighting. Because wow. everyone knew they were going up. The Battle of the Bulge had started already. Right. Um, and there's one thing. My my dad was a humble man. And he, I always say he kind of accept, he accepted himself for who he was. So he never had to put anyone down. Mm-hmm. He never had to embellish what he did. He just didn't go there. But one time we were talking about the fruit and chocolate. And he, he, my dad said of his friend, Ben Lane, well, it was more his idea than mine. <laughs> oh, that is so humble. He could have taken good, you know, full credit for it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I think my dad would have liked the chocolate and he had to give it up. <laughs> right. But, it, but he saw someone else in greater need. And how do you not respond to that? Right. Right. Wow. 
and he and he's kind of joking, kind of kind of serious. Yeah. So that was the end of Rhineland, and then they went up to the Ardennes, and I had asked what was the worst part of the war for you, and he did say Bastogne. Right. Um, and everybody kind of knows how cold it was. It was ten to twenty degrees below zero. Mm-hmm. And my dad would make comments about that to more to siblings again, and they would feed it to me. But he was with my brother once in Dane and um, driving in a wintry day. My brother said, do you, do you need something to eat? And then my dad said that, I don't even know if he said during the Battle of the Bulge, he said, sometimes or we went four to five days without eating anything except hard candy bars that made you thirsty. Yeah, he right. said thirsty. Right. Um, <laughs> and four to five days without sleep. And that's, I'm sure, from the Battle of the Bulge and from the very beginning. Right. And then there was another time my sister was pushing him in a wheelchair back into the nursing home. And it was really cold. And my dad said to one of the nurses, and I have this, I have to read it because I have quoted it. Sure. People think this is so cold. Oh, people think, yeah, here, people think this is so cold. In the service, it was just cold, and I didn't know where to sleep. We could not build fires or we'd be seen. So, wow. and then he said, I don't know why I thought of that. That's what he said. But I mean, we kind of know why he thought of it because sure. it was so cold. It was yeah. so cold. And he pulled sleds of dead bodies out of the war, out of the woods. Um, Germans and Americans mixed, I think, is what he t- he told somebody else that again. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily me. Right. And I always tried to get my dad to feel, I mean, I've mentioned this before. And I kind of wanted him to die without guilt. That's another part. Sure. But I, I wanted him to feel that what he had done was significant. It was mm-hmm. it was important. It was appreciated. So I found an Eisenhower quote, and Eisenhower had said, the 101st Airborne got enough attention. And then there was a quote, and I I read this to my dad, little has been said of the exploits of the 4th Armored or of the 35th and other units in battling their way forward under appalling conditions to join up with the Bastogne position, under appalling conditions to join up with the Bastogne position. And I think after that one or a different one, my dad said, they didn't, they didn't seem to make much of us then, but they do now. Right. But it really was just that I was feeding him, you know, it hadn't changed. It's just that I was making him aware of things that had been said. Sure. And he's not he looking that. to be a, I'm sorry, he's not looking to be a hero or, and get mm-hmm. a ticket tape parade, you know, but we all certainly want to be acknowledged for either something we've done or something we've gone through. And in his case, it was both of those. Yes. And I did ask him once about the greatest generation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I said, do you feel that yours was the greatest generation? And he didn't really feel so feel that way. And I said, some people would call you a hero. And he goes, ah, you know, that was his general (laughs) words. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. Again, very succinct. (laughs) There we go. And, and, and can I just say, I mean, because you covered this in the book, he goes a long time without being able to shower. He goes days without eating except for candy bars, which uh, makes you even more thirsty. And it's not like your dad had a ton of fat on him. I mean, he didn't have much to lose in the first place. And here he is in in this foxhole for 23 hours. It's full of water, an occasional rat. And he's got to, but he's got to stay vigilant because, you know, he doesn't want to die. And that just went on for many, many days, and I, I can't even comprehend. I won't even try to comprehend what he went through and, and the mental games he probably had to play with himself just to stay focused. I know. Yes, and to, and to try to stay alive. Yes. He did, not, he did not try to be a hero. He he knew he had a wife at home. Right. And, and she was pregnant when he left, and um, he wanted to get back. So he also was... And he was 26. He was 26 when he landed. That's a little bit older. Right. You know, you're yeah. not 19. He, he knew he knew a little bit more about how to approach it, I think, so that he maybe could survive. But could there were times right. when he, it's like, this isn't going to happen. Yeah. Right. The, just the odds. Just the just sheer the odds. Exactly. It, right. You can't always reason your way out of bullets. Right. Yeah. 
Good point. Good point. And, and, and I just want to tell everybody real quick when you, well, first of all, you're going to need it in general, but when you get to the part about the Christmas experience where you were talking about him giving over the chocolates and fruit, have a tissue or napkin ready. You're going to need it. I certainly needed it. Uh, so again, it, but it was a part of what just made this uh, a power, very powerful to read. Okay. Yeah. Um, so after the Battle of the Bulge, mm-hmm. and it was the second part of the Rhineland campaign, right. and they returned to Metz where they took a shower again, and they met the manager, and he recipro- reciprocated gifts to them for That's the fruit right. and chocolate. Right. You know, he said, I'll see you when you come back. Mm-hmm. And he gave my dad a ring that says more than yesterday, less than tomorrow. I love that. And um, that is something that we had known about. In fact, all of his daughters, he had five we all knew about that ring and we'd all worn it at different times in our lives. Wow. You know, wow. like my oldest sister maybe wore it before she got married. Then the next, then it went to the next one. Right. And um, I think she wore it through med school. Right. And then, and then I, and then I did it. I remember, <laughs> sounds silly. I have it now again. And I remember wearing it in 1978 for reasons that I'm never going to explain, but <laughs> I remember having that on. Um, right, and yeah. it, so it was mine for a while and yeah, it just kept going. So we, that's something again that we knew about. Right. Little piece of your father. Which yeah. Is, wow. Yeah. Just wow. And it's lovely to have. Yeah. Um, then the 35th went to the Vosges mountains because they thought there might be a little breakthrough by the Germans down there, like mm-hmm. a mini battle of the bulge. It never happened. Right. And they were only there for a week. And that's where the photo was taken on the cover of the book. Oh. And, um, I always thought, I, I was always surprised that my dad looked so comfortable and relaxed. And he yes. had said that stone was the worst. Yeah. He looks really comfortable. Yeah, like, a little jaunty, yeah. if you will. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. But there was somebody who went to one of my author talks and came to me afterward and said that his uncle had written a letter to his mother mm-hmm. after the Battle of the Bulge. And there was a celebratory tone to the letter. And it was as if they said, we won that one, and now it's just a matter of time. And I think that's what my dad's feeling. If, right. I, if that made sense to me, that my dad is feeling, I think I'm going to get home. Right. And he's wearing his wedding ring. Some of these things, you know, this picture is like two by three inches, and we heavily, you know, got a lot of pixels in it, whatever, and, and blew right. it up. I didn't actually see the ring until oh, yeah. quite a while afterward. Mm-hmm. Um, Another thing that's interesting about it is the shadow of his face looks very much like him later in life. Right. The shadow more than actually Aww. the picture of him as a young man. Right. And I, I kind of picture myself pushing him in a wheelchair looking at him from the right side. Right. Um, wow. The other thing about this, the picture on the on the book, which I didn't notice either, he's got really good boots on. Yeah. And they did not arrive till after the Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Too late. Yeah. Too late. yeah. <laughs> but I noticed them. I'm like, oh, those are good boots. Yeah. And, and I realized what that was. And that is on the book cover. It is his yeah. signature. He and they my, went through hell. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say one of my daughters pulled the signature off one of his medical papers right. from, during the war. And so that is how he wrote. That is his okay. signature. Okay. So they're they're in the Vosges Mountains. There's eight to ten inches of snow. They're living in f- foxholes, mm-hmm. and artillery's going overhead. But they know they're not the target. Right. He's got good warm boots on. Okay. Um, and yeah. that's basically it. They wanted to stay there. Right. <laughs> they were like, "This is great. This we're is... living large." <laughs> was... And and another thing is that the foxholes that were built there were built by Germans. Right. And they had more time to build them, and they were wider. They were bigger. Two guys could lie down. Professional affairs compared to what he's been through. This is Uh is the Ritz. Um, (laughs) This is the Ritz. Oh, my God. No one's trying to kill us, and we can lie down. (laughs) Yeah, and there's very few little water and rats, so all good (laughs) here. Yeah. No, I remember, you know, and that's the thing about life. Life is, everything is relative. Once you've been through hell, you're like, psh. Yeah, I uh-huh. I can do this. And and I'm sorry that the hell he went through was actual hell, but I, I just imagine how could that not stay with him for the rest of his so. life and give him perspective. And I think that's why he thought eight kids, 
I've been through hell, or I've been through war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been through war. What? What's eight kids? And there was always something. You know, there's right. always something getting messed up, even with fewer children. Yeah. But in any way, from the Vosges Mountains, then they were rushed north to liberate Venlo in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That was a very appreciative city. Right. So. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So then that's the end of Rhineland. Then we're on to the last. I and if this is too much, no. cut me off. No, please. But we're on to the last. Um, campaign. And one time I went to talk to a um, high school class before my father had passed away. And I asked him, what should I tell him about? And he said, tell him about the chicken. <laughs> and we all knew that story. <laughs> Not a pleasant one, but right. we, all, we all knew that story. And it was toward the end of the war. A prisoner of war had been newly released. They were trudging, they were starving. They were trudging through a little village. Mm -hmm. A chicken actually had been killed by shrapnel. A woman ran out, grabbed the chicken, went inside for the meat, keep the meat. Right. And threw the chicken innards on a on a garbage pile outside the house. And this prisoner of war was walking by and he ate the chicken guts. And my dad said as if it was good meat. Right. And that's an image that he always had. So we didn't waste food. <laughs> I, I imagine not. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Again, everything is relative. Everything's relative. Yeah. Um, then the 320th was rushed toward the Elbe River um, to try to meet the Russians. Mm -hmm. And they passed through just the 320th, not the whole 35th Division. Right. But the 320th passed through Gardelagen in Germany. And there were a thousand POWs that had burned in a barn previous night oh. by being torch they torched the straw and blocked the exits right okay and robert phillips again my buddy in georgia mm -hmm. he had sent me a photo of it and i knew and robert basically said your dad had to have been there and so i all i asked him was uh do you remember a burning barn toward the end of the war and he just kind of looked away and a little sh shake of his head no and i suspect if he lied, that's the stuff he lied about. Right. He maybe remembered, but it's like, I'm not going there. Exactly. No, I, I'm I, not going there. I was there once. I'm not returning. And then this, then I have another story from that Please. campaign. And my dad was talking to my oldest sister in Colorado. I have no idea about the context. Again, my siblings would give me information, but I didn't always have the context. Right. Anyway, my dad said to her, the swimmers probably didn't know the war was over or did not want to believe it. And I was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but she, she thought it was important enough to tell me, which, yeah. okay, fine. Right. But I'm sure I threw it on a later pile. Right. You know, just figure that, what the heck is that? <laughs> and then one time I was looking through Orville Faubus's or reading again. I'd read sections over. I was reading Orville Faubus is in a faraway land, mm -hmm. and I came upon a part where Hitler had ordered frogmen to blow up a bridge toward oh, the end of the war. Right. And they were all dressed in black and whatever, and they were carrying charges. But the current in the river was too strong. They lost their charges, and they had to crawl out of the water. And they were flitting behind trees to try to hide, but the 30, some people, uh, some soldiers from the 320th captured them. Right. And so this story... I think is about those the swimmers probably didn't know the war was over or did not want to believe it. So my dad either heard about that, saw that, but I suspect he translated for them. Oh, that's I right. suspected he yeah. interpreted for them. Yeah. Because it was important and it's something he remembered. And how I wish I had understood that. Again, that's that's that would have been an amusing story, I think, that he could have talked about. Right. Or maybe not amusing. And also, he might not have said enough. <laughs> Absolutely. He might not have expanded enough. Yeah. Could, yeah. Could, okay. Could you, one one yeah. more story that we knew. Please. And it's from the central, this, the end of the war. Right. My dad, by the end of the war, because there were so many prisoners of war, he was um, speaking German. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, he was afraid to because he thought he would get sent into situations where he could die. Right. So he never admitted that he could speak German. Mm -hmm. He just didn't trust that that would be good for him. Sure. But I think after the battle of Baljo toward the end where they were getting a lot of them and they needed someone, it's like, okay, I can do that. 
Um, but anyway, he was told to go tell the Russians in German, because they could kind of understand German, right. that the alcohol they were drinking could be poisoned. Okay. And a Russian had died the, the night before. And the whole group of Russians just cracked up. <laughs> and they're just raucous laughter. And they said, what's one? <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, and he had, and he had, he had told that, that one we had known or maybe heard not often, but I had heard that one. Right. Yeah. I mean, but again, that's their point of view. It's what's relative to them because millions, millions of Russian soldiers died and we're supposed to get worked oh. up with all due respect. You know, we're supposed right. to get worked up about one Come on. Right. Yeah. Right. We've been in this war for how long? And exactly. so many have died, and you're worried about one. Exactly. That died after celebrating with some vodka, I suppose. Yeah. So um, I, I didn't mean, let me know if there's anything else. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just want. No, that's. Okay. I just want the listeners to know that. I, I don't only recommend this book because it's got incredible stories about the war. It's not only incredible stories about your father and your story, again, rediscovering, kind of filling in the blanks of what he didn't say, which, again, perfectly makes sense. But I, I, I got the sense that you yourself were on a journey because when you would mention something, you would stop and make it make sense. I mean, like you break down the structure of the army. You, you talk about certain weapons. You talk about how his and other medals are awarded. So I almost felt like you were going along. Here's my dad, but then here's the world of war and here's the world of the army. I got to make it make sense to the reader or it, maybe things will get lost. So if you... If you don't, and this is for the listeners, if you don't know much about war, don't worry about it because you break things down in this book and it really helped make sense and put things into context. And it really made it a lot more smoother experience than it could have been. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I would say early on, uh, another person who writes told me I had to think about my target audience. And I didn't, I hadn't done that. I was just doing generalities. Yeah. But then at that point, I decided, okay, I'm writing for my daughters and their 14 cousins. Yes. You know, I'm thinking, that's who I'm thinking of. And I knew they had limited knowledge about the war. So I had to, you know, I didn't, ex didn't touch on everything, but I mean, just the basics. Right. And, um, more recently, I've, I thought, too, that my book is kind of for frontline troops. Mm -hmm. they, did, they didn't know uh, where they were, yeah. what the strategy was, that, and it wasn't part of their perspective. It wasn't part of their reality. So in some ways, I, I'm speaking to the infantrymen, and right. this is something that makes sense for them. And I have had, there were several that have contacted me and said, the war from your dad's experience is exactly right. And that was somebody who had served in Iraq, I think. Right. And then there was a woman who had served 15 years and then also Afghanistan and Iraq. And she said, you have the details and that doesn't usually happen. Wow. Yeah. So sadly, war combat never changes in that sense. Sadly. Yeah. 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 Oh, you know what? I just thought of something. If I wanted to be succinct like your father, I could have just said she threw in everything and the kitchen sink. I could have just went okay. with that. So I, I don't know why I, I didn't because I'm not succinct. So anyway, so uh, Louise, thank you very much for this book. I'm glad you spent 17 years. I hope you get out of it everything that you wanted. And, and I'm glad you're sharing this. But before I let you go, I just have one last question. Out of everything that you've been through since the moment you started to this moment now, I mean, what's what's something, either an experience or a feeling or just something that stuck with you about this incredible journey that you've been on? Well, I, th I think one of the things, and I, I don't know if that's general enough, mm -hmm. but, I, but I did come away with a feeling I'm, we are so fortunate that our father was as patient and low key as he was in a household of eight kids. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's yes. a lot of people that didn't make it that that their fathers couldn't do that. Right. And for whatever reason, my dad was able to compartmentalize it. Um, and that helped. There was somebody that came up to me after a talk and they said, my dad put bad upon bad. Right. And I think my father's childhood was good. That helped maybe a little bit. So you're putting bad upon good. Whereas mm. her father had put ba bad upon bad. Right. And I think that was just painful. And, and another one, 
and I can go on for too long and I'm sorry, no, but somebody fine. within the last year said my father had Alzheimer's. He had served in the war and she read the book. She said, I read it every letter of that book. Yes. And they didn't know why his behaviors were so unexplainable when he had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And she said, now I think I get it. It provides closure for me because I suppose he was having flashbacks. He was living a previous part of his life. And they were like, where is this coming from? Right. He didn't really explain to me his behaviors, but I mean, I can kind of imagine. Yeah. So, and um, the other part, okay, my dad was, we were fortunate to have him mm -hmm. and somehow he could handle comments about the war and he could put them in perspective without anger. So I give an example in the book of a man at his dining table in the nursing home that said one day, Oh, I always wanted to be in the war, a frau line on each arm. Oh. And I, again, all of these, there were so many of these. And I was watching my dad and I was like, I can't see anything. I can't see a single response there. Wow. And it almost seemed that his blood pressure was lower than mine. But um, <laughs> when I put, when I pushed him back to his room, he said, just, it took a little while. Yeah. And he said, maybe it's good I touched the war. At least I know what it is. And it, that's all he said about that man. He wasn't angry. Right. It's just like that guy doesn't have a clue. Yeah. And, and, and I recognize that. Listen. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say that my dad felt, at least I know something. I know it. And he has no clue. Right. So. I'm glad you put it that way, because by the time I finished reading the book, I, there was two thoughts. I had one, your father's like the straight line that never wavers. And two, I would hate to play poker with someone with a face like that. Oh, my <laughs> God, this guy could. Wow. He could have a, stra a royal flush and, I, and I, he wouldn't give anything away. But but no, well, yeah, <laughs> I think it worked out. And and again, it goes back to personality and character and and uh, priorities. And obviously he was a very focused, centered man who owned himself, who survived the war, had a family. And it sounds like, for you know, given everything that's happened, it sounds like he was good to his family and his family was good to him. And one more thing about just yeah. the whole book in general, mm -hmm. when it was all done, I mean, years, you know, it was all done. And I thought, okay, what would this have been like if he had still been alive right. when the book was published? And I thought, he would never have expected his name and photo and signature to be on the cover of a book. Yeah. And he wouldn't have liked it. He wouldn't have liked the attention. Right. And he wouldn't have read it. I'm sure he wouldn't have read it. Right. And um, I think we as his kids, if he were still at the nursing home, we would have put a big sign on the outside of his door that says, Alfred does not want to talk about the book. I'm sure oh, wow. we would have had to do that because he'd be like, no, don't make me go there. Right. I, I think yeah. you're right. Yeah, that's just not... He wanted to move on, and move on he did. Uh, yes. So, Louise, thank you very much for this again and for everyone out there. And it's even in the title, Alfred, The Quiet History of a yes. World War II Infantryman. Uh, so, Louise, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this book. And the fact, the way that you captured him, I feel like I know this gentleman uh, who I've never, ever met. And it, it was it was a pleasure to get to know him. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Making it to Wednesday is a win in itself, and Dunkin' thinks you deserve a reward. That's why every Wednesday, now through December, Dunkin' Rewards members get a free donut with drink purchase. So whether you like your midweek pick-me-ups oozing with chocolate or filled with jelly, it's on us because you deserve it. Save time and order ahead on the app with Dunkin' Rewards. Not a member? Join today. America runs on Dunkin'. Limit one classic donut per member per Wednesday. Terms and exclusions may apply. Participation may vary. Offer ends 12-27-2023. Seeing is believing, and you're not going to believe how bright and vivid the colors are on the Samsung Neo QLED and OLED TVs powered by the Neural Quantum Processor. Because this is an audio ad. Unless you can see it, which means you already have one. Nice. Samsung. More wow than ever.